Part two of Three Days on the Ohio River by William Andrus Alcott. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Part two. Chapter eight. The Coal Country. During the night we had passed by several important villages Manchester, Rome, Rockville, Portsmouth, Wheelersburg, Hanging Rock, Burlington, and Proctorsville in Ohio, and Concord, Vanceburg, Greenupsburg, and Catlettsburg in Kentucky. The face of the country was still interesting, but that of the Kentucky and Virginia side had become less so than the other. We had lost the opportunity of seeing the mouths of the Scioto and the Big Sandy Rivers, as well as many other curious and interesting objects. But what we regretted most was the loss of Portsmouth. This fine place at the mouth of the Scioto River we had hoped to pass by daylight. However, we could not expect to see every place we passed. We were now approaching the coal country, and this morning we had a fine opportunity of observing the method by which these huge steamboats provide themselves with this important article. Some of them, I believe, use wood for fuel, but not all by any means. They do not go to the wharves of the villages they pass and wait to have some twenty or thirty or fifty tons of coal shoveled into the boat. They have another and much simpler way, and one which does not hinder them a moment. Long flats or scows, deeply laden with this necessary article, proceeding from the shore, meet the steamer in the middle of the river, and by means of chains or ropes are immediately lashed to her sides, usually two of them, one on each side. The men on board the flats, aided perhaps by the crew of the steamer, immediately fall to work with their shovels and throw the coal on board when it is wanted. When the flats are emptied, the ropes are loosened, and they are set free to return to their place, now several miles down the river. The steamer is thus supplied for twelve, eighteen, or it may be twenty-four hours. But what most struck me was the facilities which the miners possess for procuring this coal from the hills, for the reader should know that the hills between which we were now passing all contain this useful mineral. This coal is in a layer somewhat different in thickness in different places, but varying from four to five feet. In the hills which the Pittsburgh was now passing, the layer, as I was informed, is about four feet thick. This layer, in countries west of the Allegheny, is horizontal, or nearly so, and this without reference to the shape of the hill that covers it. At the base of the hills it is usually found pretty near the surface, but as you proceed inward its distance from the surface increases with the ascent of the hill. In Talmadge, Ohio, last winter, I penetrated one of these coal mines, accompanied by the workmen nearly 1,000 feet. I found the stratum of coal at that place not far from 4 feet thick. This coal is split out by means of drilling and blasting, as in the case of removing any other rock. They usually proceed in a narrow way at first, perhaps eight or ten feet broad and as many high. As they go on, they place props under the incumbent hill, or what is more common, they place at suitable distances a framework around the sides to prevent its falling in. When they have penetrated several hundred feet into these coal hills, and the air does not circulate freely enough, and especially does not carry away the smoke of their powder far enough, they sometimes dig a well or hole from the top of the hill directly over the line of the excavation till it meets it. This serves as a chimney and ventilator, and is of great and lasting service. To carry the coal they have in general small cars drawn by one horse each. For this purpose a railroad is made as far as the excavation extends. When the coal is brought out of the excavation, there are many curious ways of unloading it, but I have not time to describe them all. In some instances, the coal is slid down an inclined plane a long distance by means of ropes and pulleys, and the emptied cars brought back by the same means. I found the bases of the hills on the banks of the Ohio, especially on the northern side, full of these excavations. The amount of coal which is dug here yearly must be immense. For myself, I can never think of this wonderful provision of God for human wants without feelings of gratitude. 
In a few years only, the native wood in many of these regions would in a natural course be used up in houses, factories, steamboats, and so forth. And what would the people do then for fuel had not the great eternal filled the hills with this never-failing substitute? One region in particular attracted my attention. The villages of Pomeroy, Coalport, and Sheffield were so near each other as to seem to form one continuous village about three miles in length. And here, a stranger would be apt to think, the people do little else but dig coal and burn it. The houses were almost as black with soot as the hillsides themselves. Chapter 9. The Variety of Faces I was much interested while on board the Pittsburgh, as I have often been before, in noticing the vast variety in human faces and figures. Go where you will, on board steamboats, into railroad cars, public meetings, and so forth, where are found assemblages of from 100 to 1,000, or even several thousand, persons, and survey narrowly every face, and will you find any two alike? Examine, if you please, the faces of nearest relatives, brothers, sisters, parents, children, and even twins themselves, and though you may and sometimes will find a very striking similarity, yet you will, after all, find a difference in some one or more particulars. No two in any assembly or company look exactly alike. Nay, more than all this, if you were to travel the world as much as I have done, and to see, in the course of half a century, several millions of people, you would find no two anywhere with features exactly alike. In the eight hundred millions which now inhabit our globe, there is a shade of difference such as would enable a careful eye to distinguish every one from all others. And how is it, with the mind that shines out in these varied faces, is that as distinguishable on a close acquaintance as the exterior, the features? Is there any reason why it should not be? I am not quite certain it is so, but did not the great Creator intend it should be? I do not mean to say, of course, that there are not some things alike in every face, so there are some things which must be expected to be alike in our mental formation. Every one on board this steamboat, every one in the world, resembles his fellows in the general structure and aspect of its features. Every one looks forward and upward and not downward, like the beasts that perish. Every one has the projecting brow with a well-defended eye under it, the more prominent nose and chin and so forth. So every one thinks highly of himself, his friends, possessions, home and so forth. Every one, unless by divine grace made a true Christian, is more or less selfish. Every one loves and in his way seeks happiness and hates misery. Who will show us any good is the most universal cry. If people do not say it, in so many words, they do so by their actions. It is an old maxim that actions speak louder than words, and it is of high, very high authority, that out of the abundance of the heart or mind the mouth speaketh. It is not very difficult, therefore, to guess how the various minds on board this steamer are occupied. No one is talking about the wants, the ignorance, or the means of improving the conditions of his neighbor. No one is talking, unless the thought is suggested by another, about the welfare of the great Jehovah's kingdom. But I mean not quite so much. There are a few blessed exceptions to the apparent severity of this remark. For here, just by my side, sits a woman some fifty years of age or more, who has, for more than thirty years, cared for and thought of other people as well as herself. She is the wife of Mr. Byington, a famous missionary to the Choctaw Indians. It is, I believe, nearly thirty years since she and her husband devoted themselves to the great work of trying to instruct and improve these poor people and make Christians of them. Such a person will care for the good of others and the honor of God, even on board a steamboat. Those who have been philanthropists and Christians as long as Mr. and Mrs. Byington will not soon or easily forget their former habits and become selfish like the rest of the world. I am greatly afraid that most persons who seem to be religious at home forget their religion when they go abroad. 
Indeed, I have known many who were given to prayer, watchful over their tongues, mindful of the Sabbath, and self-denying at home, who were none of these when a thousand miles from home, or even half that distance. True, we cannot always know whether people pray or not, when they are abroad, because most of what deserves the name of prayer is offered when no eye can reach but that of God. There is an opportunity for closet prayer everywhere, and it is quite possible that they who break the Sabbath indulge their appetites and do not bridle their tongues sometimes pray. Still, I must say that, judging as well as I can, the fear already expressed is but too well grounded. Chapter 10. Blennerhassett's Island Nearly every person who knows anything at all about the history of the United States has heard of Blennerhassett's Island. This island is 190 miles from Pittsburgh and 287 from Cincinnati. It is a beautiful island, but has at present an appearance of desolation that forcibly reminds the traveler what it once was. Blennerhassett, the owner, was a man of great taste, and, till his connection with Burr, quite an inoffensive man and a good citizen. But no one could be long in peace and quiet who had anything to do with the seditious, ambitious, and treasonable Aaron Burr. It is true he was not legally convicted of treason, but he was finally ruined in character and property as a cause of his evident wrongdoing. Instead of a beautiful mansion, fifty-four feet square, two stories high and well-proportioned, with two wings and a charming little garden, with every delicacy of fruit, vegetable, and flowers which could be made to grow in that climate, with the most beautiful walks and shrubbery, nothing now is seen but a heap of ruins. All day long, this second of our days on the river, we were hoping the boat would reach Blennerhassett's Island before night, or at least before bedtime, but we were doomed to disappointment. At the latest hour which it was proper for us to be awake, the boat was some thirty to fifty miles below. We passed the next day the mouths of two beautiful rivers on the Virginia side, the Big Sandy and the Great Kanawha. It was curious to see the line formed by the junction or union of the two rivers, the one with its blue clear waters, the other with its turbid milky current. They seem as if made of entirely different materials. We also passed, besides the coaling places I have named, several considerable villages, among which were Point Pleasant, Murraysville, and Bellsville, Virginia, and Gallipolis and Millersburg in Ohio. We also lost sight during the night of Marietta at the mouth of the Muskingum River, now quite a large and pleasant village, near which are several very remarkable ancient fortifications and mounds of earth, supposed to have been the depositories of the dead by some now unknown people. Chapter 11. The Ancient Mounds The morning of the third day found us passing Sisterville in Virginia. Soon afterward we passed New Martinsville. We saw several mounds. One was very small, another was large, but somewhat disfigured by having been excavated. We were now approaching a village on the Virginia side called Elizabethtown, near which a small stream joins the Ohio, known by the name of Big Grave Creek. In this village of Elizabethtown is one of the largest, most perfect, and most beautiful mounds to be found in the whole Ohio country. We were told of this curiosity before we reached the place, so that we were not taken by surprise. Besides, the boat stopped a few moments at the wharf, in full sight of it, not a quarter of a mile distant. This mound is about 180 feet in diameter at its base, and some 70 or 75 feet high. On its top is an old tower or observatory, around which are several trees, some of them of considerable age. One, a venerable oak, is four feet in diameter. The center of its top is a kind of crater or basin, four feet deep and eight or ten across it. Elsewhere the top of the mound is perfectly flat. One puzzler to the traveler is where the earth was obtained for building such a huge pile, for it is situated almost in the middle of a large plain, on and near which is no appearance of any former excavation for this purpose. There are, however, several smaller mounds a little east of it. The country near the Ohio abounds with these mounds. 
What they were and by whom they were formed is quite uncertain. The general opinion that they are the graves of some ancient people is sustained by the fact that they contain human bones, sometimes in considerable numbers. A gentleman on board the boat, a man of intelligence, informed me that he had seen in eastern Tennessee or western North Carolina a species of mounds of a very different description. They were composed essentially of small stones, between which were layers of bones. And what made the case very remarkable indeed, there are no stones of the kind found in these mounds within many miles of them, and there is no appearance of there ever having been any. CHAPTER Twelve: A SUSPENSION BRIDGE About noon the third day we came in sight of Wheeling in Virginia. This is a considerable place. It contains about 10,000 inhabitants. The boat stopped at Wheeling an hour or more to unload a part of her freight. This gave us a fine opportunity to go on shore and view the town. It is well built, but like most of the places all the way from Cincinnati to Pittsburgh, has quite a sooty appearance caused by the dust of the coal, which they burn here in large quantities. Wheeling is, moreover, a place of considerable manufacture. But the greatest curiosity at this place, and one of the greatest I have ever seen, is the suspension bridge thrown over the Ohio. It must be something like 1,000 feet in length, as broad as most bridges are, and not far from 90 feet above the surface of the river when the water is low though much less, of course, at times when the river rises. The bridge is much more remarkable than the suspension bridge first built over Niagara River, for while that is much higher above the water than this, it is, in comparison, very narrow indeed. The suspension bridge at Wheeling is broad enough for several carriages to go side by side on it, but that below Niagara Falls is only just broad enough for one. I would have visited it, but I was afraid the boat in which I was traveling would leave the wharf by some means sooner than was expected, and it would be a sad thing to be left in port with our trunks all on board. Many of the company did venture, however, and they returned, too, in good time. Bridgeport, a small but flourishing village, is on the Ohio side of the river, just opposite Wheeling. The whole region is noted for burnings and massacres during the wars of our country with the Indians a little more than fifty years ago. One anecdote I will relate very briefly. In March 1793, about fifty-nine years ago, as two brothers by the name of Johnson, one of them twelve, the other nine years of age, were playing by the side of the river some ten or twelve miles above Wheeling, they were suddenly seized by two Indians and carried about six miles into the woods. Here the savages built a fire and halted for the night. When they lay down to rest, each Indian took a boy on his arm. As may easily be conjectured, however, the boys did not sleep. Finding the Indians to be very sound asleep, they concerted a plan, young as they were, for destroying them and effecting their escape. The plan succeeded. One of the Indians was shot with his own rifle, the other was killed with a tomahawk. The boys returned to their own homes the next day in safety. Chapter 13 Logan, the Mingo Chief On board our steamboat was one man, a citizen of Cincinnati, whose extensive and intimate acquaintance with the country through which we were traveling made his society both interesting and valuable. As we were passing between some very abrupt hills, he took occasion to remark that all this was once the hunting ground of Logan, the celebrated Mingo chief, whose sad story is familiar, as I suppose, to every schoolboy in the country. Logan was a savage, but he was at the same time a man and had a man's heart. Indians are men and have the feelings of men, and one cannot help pitying them how greatly to be regretted that they were not treated by everybody as William Penn treated them in and about Pennsylvania. The books we had on board, purporting to be traveler's guides, most of which were doubtless correct, pointed out to us, as did also our Cincinnati friend, the plain on which Logan resided, as well as the place where his family was so wickedly murdered. We would have lingered at the last-mentioned spot, but had only time to drop a tear and hasten on. Chapter 14 Third Night on the River 
Night was once more approaching, and we were, as yet, some sixty-five or seventy miles from Pittsburgh. The last place we saw by daylight was Steubenville, on the Ohio side, a large and flourishing village. We were anxious to see Wellsville, Ohio, and Beaver and Economy in Pennsylvania, but it was late at night when we passed the latter two, and too dark to see much when we passed the former. Economy is a neat little place, first settled by the celebrated German named Rapp. It still bears the marks he made on it in the appearance of neatness and thrift, which are everywhere visible. We were much annoyed during the last two days and nights, especially the very last, by the cattle on board. Had there been a cow yard with contiguous stables that were seldom if ever cleansed, the air from the lower deck could hardly have been more offensive. I often wondered why the owners of the boat should dare to go in the face of public sentiment to an extent like this. Would it not be reported by the passengers that we suffered from this annoyance? And would not travelers shun the boat in time to come? However, we slept well for the most part during the night, and it was well for those of us who were going further than Pittsburgh that we did. A few were distressed with the effects of drinking so much lime water during the voyage, but the far greater part of us rose in the morning refreshed and in fine health and spirits. Chapter 15. Arrival at Pittsburgh with Reflections The morning had come, and we were now approaching Pittsburgh. It was just about sunrise when we came in view of its spires and buildings. The passengers were scrambling up, now in every direction. Some of the passengers were now at the end of their journey, others had to go further, and some of us many hundred miles further. However, we were all alike glad to get on shore. But our trunks, where were they? They had, for the greater part, been piled together in a certain place on the deck of the boat, under the care of the steward. They were safe, only it was difficult at first to find them. Here is mine. It must be marked for the railroad across the Allegheny Mountains to Philadelphia. All this was easily disposed of, and now it is to go with a baggage wagon and to be taken to the railroad depot. On removing the trunk to the baggage wagon, the steward reminded me that it was his custom to receive a small sum of each traveler for taking care of his trunk while on board. I asked him how much. Anything, he said, you please to give. I was not satisfied with the charge, for I supposed he had his pay by the month, or in some such way, and his regular compensation was sufficient for every purpose. But though a colored man, he was quite a gentleman, and I could not well refuse him. How many little taxes one must pay in a busy world like this! Well, an honest Christian man has no very strong objection to paying them whenever, in so doing, he does not go contrary to the principles of right, and these little taxations, as you travel along, by servants and porters and stewards, though they are annoyances, seem to me to be of this description. I was at length in Pittsburgh. I had always heard that it was a smoky city, and was not, therefore, at all disappointed. In truth, I did not see it to be more sooty than several other places below it on the river. Pittsburgh is about half as large as Cincinnati and is pleasantly situated at the junction of two large rivers. It seems to be a very busy, bustling place, for though it was yet early in the morning, quite early, the streets were pretty well filled with travelers and carriages. Opposite Pittsburgh, that is, across the Allegheny River, is Allegheny, which of itself would make quite a large city. It is at least as large as New Haven or Salem or perhaps Troy. And now, though I am soon to proceed, yet as the cars are not yet ready, I have a little time for reflection, and I avail myself of it. The world itself seems to me like a great steamboat, larger indeed than the Pittsburgh, and yet a huge passenger boat. People are continually coming on board and continually leaving it. Today we form an acquaintance with a few of the vast variety of faces we see. Tomorrow, perhaps, they are separated from us, to go we know not whither. One striking difference there is in the two cases. When the passengers separated at Pittsburgh, and so also of other separations at Wheeling and other places below, it was not with a certainty that the separation was final for this world. There was, at the least, a possibility of meeting again somewhere 
and at some time. But when we separate in the great steamboat of the world at the verge of eternity, when we step forth upon its immeasurable shore, it is with positive certainty of meeting no more in this world. We may meet again. We shall, most undoubtedly. We shall meet at the sound, not of the little bell to which we are accustomed on board the boats of western rivers, but of the trump of God. We shall meet, but it will be at the general judgment. We shall meet, but it will be in the immediate presence of God. Will our meeting be a pleasant one? Will it be pleasant to all, or only to a part? And who will be the happy ones, and who the unhappy? Shall you, reader, or I, be of the former number, or shall it be our lot to be of the latter? God, in his mercy, in Christ, has left the matter to our own choice. This is right, is it not? He has made us free to choose about other matters. Why not about this? He certainly would not compel us to a joyful meeting. Be it our first business, then, our great business, our only business, so to conduct while on the passage boat of life, that whether we are sailing on the Ohio River or traveling elsewhere, we may always be found in the path of duty and always ready for anything whatever to which we may be called, here or hereafter. End of Part 2 End of Three Days on the Ohio River by William Andrus Alcott